Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Bo again. So today, we're going to talk about how to be a superhero. Uh, now, today's going to be very different than most of the videos on this channel. This video is at the request of some teachers who either have heard about equipment but have no idea what it looks like or how to use it, or some that were given equipment and never told how to use it. Um, so, we will be going over tourniquets. I do have one of the uh, CAT Generation 7 tourniquets here. Um, we will compare that to another tourniquet when it comes to uh, pediatrics to see if the study holds up anecdotally right here in front of you. Uh, I'll go ahead and tell you now it does. Um, we have a chest seal. Show you what it looks like. We're going to open one up, show you what it looks like, how generally to apply it. Um, one thing that I want to be clear about is that this is uh, the beginning of your journey. It's not the end. Okay, This isn't enough. This isn't training. You need real training. Um, this is to familiarize us with the equipment. That's it. You can get Stop the Bleed courses. You can um, even look on YouTube for people who are way better at this, who are way more up to date than I am. And once you have training, you want to stay up to date. You definitely want to stay up to date because what is considered best practices changes over time. Uh, you know, I first learned CPR like forever ago. I don't know. It was in the late 1900s. Um, the only thing that's the same today <laughs> as, you know, then is the songs you sing to make sure you get the right beats per minute. If you're curious, it's either staying alive or another one bites the dust. Aren't those fitting? Um, so just given something that simple, CPR, and, and what is considered best practices when it comes to that, stuff like this is going to change. You want to stay up to date. You want to give the people that you're trying to help the best chance. You want to have as many options available to you. Um, so don't view this as a training course. It's not. This is not sufficient. I feel like I've said that enough now. Okay, one of the questions that I got from somebody was apparently they just gave you the supplies. What do you want to store it in? I would use something like this. This is a normal IFIC, IFAC pouch, right? Um, this is one similar to the one that the military uses. has the, the molly straps up front. And you could use that to attach additional tourniquet holders and put more tourniquets on the outside, which I would do, um, given the situation you're trying to prepare for. And then I would take it and use these rings to mount it to something. Okay, Mount it to a desk, to a wall, something that, that would be accessible in that type of situation. Inside this only goes the trauma stuff. The the boo-boo first aid kit for minor stuff, that can be somewhere else. This, you want to know where this is at all times. Um, you don't want a janitor to pick it up and move it or a substitute teacher or a student. You don't want to spend minutes looking for this when seconds count. You want to know where this is. So have it somewhere secured. Now, one of the things about it is when you say that, people are like, well, what if I need to move it? It's okay because of the way they're designed. The bag separates from the mount via Velcro. Okay? So, this is the type that I would use. Okay. So, this... I already tore my glove. This is a cat tourniquet. This one is Generation 7. So the band goes around the limb, okay? This is tightened and it restricts flow. Then you take it, you clip it into that. I'm really hoping you can see all of this. It slides right into there. Then just tight. says time, write the time down. Um, hopefully you won't be in the situation long enough to leave this there to where the time matters. But I'm starting to have my doubts. Um, so, 
general idea, the loop over the limb, tighten it, and then you use this to tighten and restrict flow even further, clip it in, and strap it. Okay, this is a PVC pipe. It is roughly the size of a child's arm, child's limb, because, you know, that's what we're talking about here. So it goes over, tighten it, right? Okay. Now you would spin this. The thing is, this is the generation seven. It doesn't spin because the PVC pipe doesn't compress, which means this is pretty much already, I mean, this is already flush up against the pipe. You can't, you can't spin it anymore. Okay. So one thing while I have it here, I want to show you something. When you're talking about small limbs, even if you were to spin it, if you were to spin it up, wind it up way over here, it wouldn't be able to clip in. And that's one of the main things about these tourniquets that, that is so good. Once you clip it in, you don't have to stand right beside the patient, right? So what you want to do is make sure it's over, way over near the clips before you start spinning. Right? Okay, so the Generation 7, very, very tight just by using the strap. You're not even using the wind-up part. This one is like Bob's tourniquet. I don't even know what brand this is. I don't know where this came from. I think Keith left this in my truck. Um, it is definitely not a Generation 7. Does it function the same way? It does in the sense that you put the band over and tighten with it. Okay. But here's the thing. As tight as you can get it, you can still spin. So that study... Clip it in, close that. That study that says that Generation 7 works better on smaller limbs, that report, all of that information is definitely backed up by this visually. Um, so if you have any questions about whether or not that's true or it's just marketing, yeah, it certainly appears to be true just from a real quick accidental test with a PVC pipe. Okay, this is Woody. Woody has a hole. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, stop it. This is a chest seal. People have asked what it actually does. And it creates a, uh, an artificial chest wall. Okay, If there's a puncture, basically anywhere from the neck to kind of the belly button, um, it, it runs the risk of creating a situation where air goes into the chest cavity and then it doesn't allow the lungs to expand. That's that's really bad. So what you want to do is, is stop that from happening. Now the reason I have gloves on is because if you were to run into this situation, your glove will help create a seal for a moment anyway. Now when it comes to the actual chest seals, you have the pack. It has written instructions on the front. On the back, it has uh, army instructions. They're little cartoons. All right. So you open the thing up. All right. Tear at the little red lines. Inside, hopefully, there should be some gauze and the seal. Now, when you open this, open it carefully. And we'll explain why in a second, because it answers another one of your questions. So here is your uh, seal. This is how it comes out. Okay. And there is the gauze right inside. So you take the gauze, wipe up anything that's there. You want it dry so it can stick, right? Makes sense. You have the red tab and a clear tab. You separate them. Okay. Red tab, clear tab. You separate. This, this part, you can set aside. Also, could save it in a, in a situation, and we'll get to that. This is the dressing. One side is super sticky, one side isn't. The side that is super sticky goes over the hole. You hopefully can see that there is a circular shape in the center of it, right? With some lines going out. The circular shape goes directly over the hole. You press it down like that. 
you want to get it as flat as possible and you want to make sure that it sticks. Now those vents allow air or fluid to come out of the chest cavity but when you breathe in it sticks to you so it doesn't allow anything else to go in. This is in my opinion would be the best kind um, to use in this type of situation. Now if something went in this side, what might have happened on the other side? It might have come out. So always make sure that you roll the, the person over because you're probably going to have to apply one there too. And keep in mind that it may not be where you think it would be. The exit may not be directly behind it because it could have come in at an angle. It could have hit something. So make sure you check both sides. All right? Okay, now I said to save the packaging. That addresses one of the big questions that came up. People who got kits, who had, you know, schools or whatever, give them kits. Apparently they have like two, maybe four of these in there. That's probably not enough. If you were to look for videos on improvised chest seals, they would say, find a piece of plastic and some tape. This and this, in each, in each one of these, if you're doing entry and exit, okay, this is going to give you, if you save the packaging, you have an additional six seals. So save the packaging and make sure you have some tape uh, in, in your kit. Now, when you put these on, there are different ways to do it. Some say, you know, you could do three sides. Some say just to do the corners. Some say do all four sides. Um, I'm not going to tell you what I prefer because I really do want to stress the fact that this isn't training. This isn't enough. There are options and there are ways to improvise this stuff. And there's a bunch of information on it um, online and on YouTube from people who are far more qualified than me. Look to them. Th this is really just more to pique curiosity and answer a couple of questions. Um, this is how you become a superhero. This is how you save lives. This is how you can make the world a better place. Um, this training, uh, if I haven't mentioned it, Stop the Bleed is a really good one. Um, there's a whole bunch that are available. Sign up. It's normally not expensive. Some of them even have online um, courses to take. This isn't enough. This is just a basic understanding of it. You really do need more. If you are going, one thing I do want to point out, <laughs> because as I say that, I know somebody isn't going to. If you use something like this that isn't vented, the seal that we put on, the chest seal that we put on was vented. That's what those lines coming out from the inner circle were. If it's not vented, it has to be burped. Um, so that's something you need to look into. You have to study more. This isn't enough please. You're, you're really talking about maybe eight hours of training and, and it will make the, it could, it could very well be the difference between life and death for a whole lot of people. Um, so I hope that answers the questions as far as the chest seals and the tourniquets. These are the two big pieces of equipment that could be real lifesavers in a situation like that. Um, I hope that answers the questions. It's not enough. You need more. Um, and you need to know where to apply the tourniquets. And the mannequin is really the only way to show that because trying to describe it, if I say above the wound, depending on how people take that, it, it, it could be taken incorrectly. So please get more training. If you are looking to uh, beef up your kit in your class, these are the items that you're probably going to need more of. And gauze. You, you can never have enough gauze, ever. Um, if you can find it, get combat gauze. It, it has an agent on it to help uh, stop bleeding. Uh, but any kind of gauze is good. But just beginning of the journey, not the end. All right? Anyway, it's just a thought. Y'all have a good day.